But since no one does likes Bob Dylan, maybe it's not good to end. Yeah, a lot of people like Bob Dylan, and also this is like I mean, not, no, the three of us. So. I like I like early sixties mm. Bob Dylan. Okay. Uh, anything after that is I think is god awful. But I'm 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 okay with. He'll stand by the, his his early works. Uh, yeah, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna fight for them in a bar. But, but uh, do, do we want to have him in on the pod? His music. I mean, it's the John Birch Society Blues. Okay. Yeah, that sounds appropriate. Okay. Look, I didn't like Bob Dylan either until I was like going on some thing in Texas out in the country, and we were all in the back of a pickup truck listening to playing Don't Think Twice, It's All Right, uh, staring up at the Texas sky, and <laughs> there's, there is a time for Bob Dylan. I just can't stand his fucking voice. Yeah. <laughs> Welcome to Tenepod in the Morning with Fritz, Boris, and Ray. Rare, a rare breakfast episode for us oh, yeah. here in the old compound. Which means that's going to be a Tuesday episode for you guys. We got both, <laughs> got both scones and scones. That's right. Yeah, this one's coming yeah. out on Tuesday. Waffles take a while to get right. Indeed. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, Boris dragged us out of our bunks. Yeah, by, for by some the real... Um, our necks into the, into the kitchen there. For a pretty interesting topic, it's it's a broad one, I think, uh, for this arc. I mean, I, I kind of found it, um, well, I should say what we're talking about first. We're talking about the John Birch Society today. Ah, okay. That um, explains it. And it, it's kind of a difficult group to talk about in like a concise way. Hmm. Um, I, I guess kind of compared to some of the other groups in this arc, f- for the reason that they never really went away. Yeah. I mean, mm-hmm. the group itself had its like heyday and membership, but they were remarkably successful, especially compared to some of the other groups that we've talked about so far in this arc in like pushing their views into now basically the mainstream. Um, so in that sense, it's the group itself is interesting to me. Um, and, you know, the history of it is is quite, you know, uh, a cast of characters. Uh, and there's some pretty fun and weird shit there. Um, but the ideology that it promoted and still promotes today is kind of, you know, what I'm most interested in. Uh, because, I mean, people started talking about the John Birch Society again in the around 2010, you know, with the Tea Party, um, which has a direct link to the uh, old John Birch Society, which we'll talk about in a little bit. And then, you know, of course, with Trump. Um, uh-huh. and you know, his ideology and followers also bears a close resemblance to, you know, some of the John Birch society stuff. And of course, uh, Trump's dad was, was friends with Robert Welch apparently. All right. So, um, I mean, there's, you guys that, remember, there's another direct connection there. Do you remember um, when we thought the tea partiers were crazy back yeah, in the good I old do, days? I, I do recall the, that. Yeah. Simpler times <laughs> when they were the wackos. Yeah, well, I, I mean, in both cases of the Tea Party and the John Birch Society, it's been described uh, as like a grassroots movement, which it absolutely wasn't. Uh, neither right. of them were. And, yeah. you know, it's all goes to show how much uh, if you get a bunch of rich people together to push an ideology, <laughs> how far you can take it. Because, yeah. I mean, that's essentially, you know, when we talk about the Tea Party, we talk about the Koch brothers whose father was a founding member of the John Birch Society. They published John Birch literature uh, and Coke Industries and the like. Um, yeah, and- no, I think a lot of these characters that we'll talk about in this arc started in John, like the John Birch Society. Like, and yeah, then absolutely. And moved on to something yeah. else. Like, um, you know, Depew, for example, of Minute Man. Uh, yeah, Depew. Absolutely. Yeah, I don't know. Maybe even like uh, Rockwell was a member. Yeah, point. Rockwell was apparently a member. Um, mm. They we'll get into why it's kind of complicated to talk about that because they closely guard their membership lists and always have mm. and mm-hmm. have been pretty mm-hmm. hostile to really revealing who all 
is or was a member at different times. Um, you know, some of that eventually got leaked or after people left, they would, you know, s- revealed their membership in the John Birch Society, but they did keep this kind of secret organization and they do to this day. Um, but of course, I mean, as a result, when you start looking at where all these people went and who the various people involved with, it starts to resemble an octopus whose tentacles oh. stretch in every which way, and they come all back to a central brain in Moscow. Um, yeah. That's <laughs> in this case, okay. no, not Moscow, but that is a more or less a direct quote. Um, Although they said Moscow in in the city of Uskamenogorsk, which is oh specific, uh, yeah, very specific, uh, some place in Siberia, I guess this is Red Central Command or something. Um, so, what is the John Birch Society? Um, I mean, it was founded in 1958 by Robert H. W. Welch, who is a weirdo in the candy business, and we'll get into his little biography um, a little bit later. But you know, at its height in Let's say 1950, uh, 1965 and six, it had a membership of around 100,000. Again, the numbers are not quite clear because they've been yeah. so hostile to revealing their membership. I mean, uh, Welch had this dream of, you know, his, his original goal was to get a million members, and that didn't happen. But it turns out, again, if you have a lot of rich people, um, it, doesn't, <laughs> it doesn't really matter how many of you there are. And, you know, he was aware of, this as you know this was one of his main goals although the when they speak in public they take on this very middle class character and um we'll we'll talk mm-hmm. about why that is as well um but you know it started to decrease it had a number of scandals um and you know by 1968 it had lost a whole lot of its members um and then continued to kind of decline over the decades um but you know it's still around today you can still go on youtube and more importantly they went from being the kind of described by other republicans as the lunatic fringe of the conservative movement to now you know bircher ideas being the mainstream and stuff you can hear on fox news uh for example the war on christmas uh uh started uh with the john burr society it was um this like odd fellow uh who Welch really liked uh named Herbert uh Craiglow uh who initially published his um screeds on the war on the communist war on christmas in um Birch the John Birch Society's newspaper the American Opinion so you know that's something that anybody who has watched Fox News uh yeah. knows about or lives in america or lives in america uh <laughs> the, yes. the, the heart of the war on christmas yeah yes um i fought in that war <laughs> yeah i bet you did <laughs> yeah well did you know that it was the u.n and the communists working together to destroy christmas and removed remove christ from christmas yeah i, I know who my paymasters are that's right you do it's patrons <laughs> yeah <laughs> uh they made a pretty big impact in popular culture too which is why you know a lot of people also know them outside of just you know their political activities in the 60s oh so many um, songs so many songs right uh notably by bob dylan yeah um bob i think that was the the first lyrics of his that were ever published anywhere or his um were all right a, a, his song about the John Birch Society. Yeah, I see here um, too that Pete Seeger, uh, the original yep. Bob Dylan, yep, 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 <laughs> also yep. put out a song. Uh, Fuck yeah. Again, returning to Doctor Strangelove for the second time this arc, uh, the character of Jack D. Ripper is um, based largely off of um, you know John Birch Society uh, rhetoric, and actually one particular case too that we'll talk about more specifically later uh-huh. in the episode. Um, all right, you, and, got, you, know, you got me excited about it. Uh, Hunter Thompson wrote about them too, and Hell's Angels that Fuck comes yeah. up. Uh, I mean, you know, they were a, a very, very prominent uh, public force in in the early to late '60s, uh, throughout the '60s, basically. Um, so. Uh, let's get one thing out of the way first, and that's who the fuck is John Birch? Um, <laughs> because you know it's. We would not know about this character, John Birch, if it wasn't for uh, Robert Welch's obsession with this rather obscure case in history. Mm -hmm. Um, So John Birch 
in short, was a Christian missionary who was killed in China at the end of World War II by the Chinese communists. Okay. Now, Birch was born into a missionary family in British India, uh, but grew up in the U.S. and uh, was reportedly like a pretty smart guy, a very dedicated Christian, who went from being a Presbyterian uh, to a Southern Baptist. And... Uh, you know, at age 12 had decided he was going to become a missionary and went to one of these, you know, Baptist missionary training schools in Texas um, where he was trained. And then at age 20, he was sent to China. So he was sent there. Uh, he was 20 years old and this was 1940. Um, so, you know, the, the U S had not gotten involved in the second world war yet, but the war in China was raging for several years, right? Yeah. Um, the Japanese occupation of China. Uh, Birch, you know, reportedly learned Chinese and was rather sympathetic uh, to the struggle against the Jack Japanese occupier. And when Pearl Harbor runs, uh, rolls around, he enlists in the U.S. Army. Um, now, some people may know that the U.S. military did have a presence in China at the time. There were the Flying Tigers, uh, which is basically a uh, u.s airmen fighting on the chinese side uh chinese nationalist side um and you know birch wanted to become part of this very much uh but instead was uh put into the oss um which we know to right. be predecessor to the cia um so he spent his career in the war as an oss officer and it was as an officer of the oss that he would eventually meet his doom um <laughs> Literally a few days after, you know, Japan had surrendered and the war is officially over. And of course, as we know, the war in China was not quite over yet. There was yeah, still yeah. the struggle between the communists and the nationalists. Now, John Birch found himself uh, in, again, this is like a really obscure incident. It's, it's really interesting that he became so obsessed with this. Uh, John Birch was executed by... Uh, Chinese communists for he got into an altercation in a communist held city where he refused to surrender his sidearm um, and whatever officer uh, got tired of him and had him executed. Damn. Uh, <laughs> now, contrary to what uh, Welch believed about this incident, uh, we find out later that Mao actually took some measures regarding this incident, he did not want to piss off the Americans at this particular time. Uh -huh. uh, so, you know, Mao actually got involved personally to, um, you know, take action against the officers who had executed this guy and, you know, told his guys to basically lay off OSS guys, you know, don't kill them, uh, right. uh, that kind of thing. But to Welch, um, John Birch was the first victim of World War Three and was this... Uh, Big martyr, uh, the first American casualty um, in this new war uh, that the communists were waging uh, that is part of their global conspiracy to take over the world. So he wasn't martyred as a missionary. He was martyred as a guy who wouldn't want to give up his firearm. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. Is that much. right? So proper uh, yeah, American yeah, yeah, yeah. martyr then. Yeah. yeah. If only there was something in the Bible about, you know, living by the sword and... Yeah, How someone may or um, may not die. <laughs> although you know, Welch himself was not a religious fanatic, and um, he kind of gets into that a little bit in in his writings. Um, so, like, yes, you know, it is significant that he was a missionary and that he was a Christian. But to him, Birch represents like the core values of like America. Um, <laughs> Obstinate. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, Obstinance uh, and imperialism, <laughs> uh, and and being a OSS agent, I guess right. yeah. apparently yeah. is not part of the big government conspiracy. That was a yeah. noble thing to to be at that time, and he has some fucking cockamamie ideas about what actually happened in World War Two, uh, which we'll talk about a little bit more when when he like starts developing his ideology. But you know, by all accounts, Birch, his family. Uh, his mother was made an honorary lifetime member of the John Birch Society, and his brothers had joined, but then subsequently left, and a bunch of them criticized the organization later and were like, John Birch was not into this kind of shit. Like, what the, you know, what the fuck are you talking about? Uh, that kind of thing. But um, the only reason anybody knows about this, you know, weird thing that happened in China in the 
days following the Japanese surrender is because of Robert Welch. Yeah. Um, so, you know, that's pretty much all there is to say about John Birch himself. I mean, he de- he was at like 20, whatever, 26 when he died or something. You know, this guy didn't, you know, ha- exactly lead a, a long life in his crusade against, you know, the communist octopus. Um, <laughs> so we should then get into who the fuck is Robert Welch. Now, Robert Welch was born in 1899 in North Carolina on a farm on December 1st. Uh, He was, by all accounts of Wunderkind, uh, like, absolutely did incredibly well at school. Yeah, he graduated university at age 16. um, (laughs) Did a little bit of time in the U.S. Naval Academy and then enrolled in Harvard Law but dropped out uh, before graduating to go into the candy manufacturing business. Ah, um, nice. He's like, uh, so, he's like uh, America's uh, Poroshenko or whatever, that Ukrainian. Uh. Yeah, 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 yeah. So this is uh, 1922. Um, right. He goes into some, a bunch of different ventures to, um, you know, starts a bunch of different candy companies, develops a candy called the Papa Sucker, uh, which just Ugh. just really doesn't sound good Why? in this day and age. I guess in the twenties maybe that that sounded okay, but like I doubt it. Papa sucker, yeah. Uh, but he was not a successful businessman uh, on his own. Um, you know, I, this is often the case with some of these people, and you know they really do see themselves as self-made men. Although you right. know they really ride on the on the uh, coattails of others. In this case, his younger brother, who was also in the candy business, uh, mm. who did have a successful company. So all of Robert's businesses failed. And so he joined his brother's company in Boston, the John O. Welch company, which, um, produced some candies that, um, most Americans would recognize, uh, you know, the kind of thing that are available in, you know, concession stands at the movie theater, like junior mints, oh, yeah. uh, sugar daddies, uh, yeah, buddy. sugar babies, Hit me. uh, among others. And so, you know, <laughs> if you, Fritz is recognizing these, these candies now in 2021. So obviously that was a very successful company. Um, it would eventually get absorbed by Nabisco in the sixties. But at that point, Robert Welch had already retired and became a full on, uh, John Bircher. Um, so, you know, Robert Welch considers his time in the business world as being absolutely formative to his political ideas. Um, and it is through the business world that he saw the communist conspiracy clearest. Now, he became vice president of this company, like I said, a hugely successful company. So obviously making a lot of money and meeting a lot of people. Um you know, at the same time, he was director of the Boston Chamber of Commerce, a bank, members of the school board. Uh, he spent his Second World War on the board of the Office of Price Administration, again, working for the government. Um, uh, and after the war, he became uh, the director of the National Association of Manufacturers. And this is quite important. This was a very prestigious position in the business world. He held that position for seven years. And a lot of the people that would go on to become the founding members of the John Birch Society were people that he met um, through, through, uh, through this position. Um, now, when we go to talk about his ideology and what is recognizable today as this like right-wing anti-government philosophy, it definitely wasn't unique in any way to Welch. I mean, he didn't obviously come up with that. It was very popular among rich business people at the time as well. Um, but I think what he was able to do is politicize it in this, you know, very infectious way uh, by connecting it then to this um, broad communist conspiracy, um, which had a- appeal to, you know, other rich assholes. In fact, you know, he would say um, that, you know, the socialists, uh, call business, call businessmen crooks so that nobody will speak up for them. Nobody will speak up for the poor businessmen, ah. <laughs> the National Manufacturer, <laughs> National Association of Manufacturers, poor guys. Uh, you know, the commies dupe these, these idiots to join unions and promote yeah. anti-business sentiment. Yeah. And, you know, Man. farmers don't like them either. And, oh, these poor, poor guys. And this is, you know, in, indicative of this vast conspiracy. 
Yeah, candy um, store manufacturers are truly the wretched of the earth. <laughs> yeah, I guess so. <laughs> um, but you know what's what at the core of this ideology, and and this is you know why it's you know so prominent in the business world is you know this idea of individualism versus collectivism, and this is like the core of the John Birch Society uh, ideology. But we'll get more into that in a sec. Um, so before founding the actual organization, um, his political opinions were shaped by his attempts uh, to run for office himself unsuccessfully. Um, and his you know, losses here, again, seem to indicate to him that, uh, that there was some sort of more powerful uh, force conspiracy going on um, that you know, prevented him from coming into you know, any kind of political office. Um, so in 1954, he became, uh, he began to write his famous book, the politician, uh, which was kind of a, a secret manuscript, uh, that was supposed to be, you know, only read by his, you know, core members that later got leaked. And this is where a lot of this controversy came from. Um, we'll talk about that in a little bit too. Uh, and in 1956, he launched his magazine, uh, American opinion, uh, which was you know the core uh newspaper for the john birch society um so he launched that of course before um he founded the group himself but um you know his unsuccessful political career led him also to the idea that there needs to be a political act uh, advocacy group right if he can't do it in the communist controlled government um and you know, very few people can because this conspiracy is so powerful that it really is controlling everyone except for a few people operating on the uh, on the margins uh, who are like you know good guys uh, in this beast, namely McCarthy, for example. Uh-huh. Uh, sure. But you know, th- there are some others as well, Southern segregationists and and whatever people that are you know guys of virtue. Um, that you know, if if they can't do it from within the system they have to found an organization that's going to work outside to promote these ideas um and so then the john birch society would be officially founded in december of 1958 now he went about this in a kind of interesting way um there was a national meeting of the national association of manufacturers at this point he had um about a year before retired uh, and decided to like dedicate himself fully to founding this organization. And so he carefully hand selected, uh, 17 people that he would invite to another conference in Indianapolis, which was going to be where he established the organization, but he didn't tell them that he (laughs) wrote to them this kind of cryptic letter saying, uh, there is some, there's a matter of the utmost importance that we need to discuss. Um, and for some reason, I guess he was respected enough, uh, or that, you know, this was compelling enough to get, uh, I think 11 out of the 17 people that he invited to attend. And these people would, uh, become the founding members of the John Birch Society. And oh, it's an interesting, uh, yeah, yeah. Damn. Um, must've been a great speech. I think actually, except for one. Uh, you can read the founding speech because that is the founding text of the John Birch Society. It's okay. his blue book, which is his own little like Mein Kampf. Um, and let's just go through the list a little bit. Um, now, of course, we have Fred Koch, um, who is the father of the Koch brothers and Koch Industries, who uh, was the president of Rock Island Oil, um, one of the you know wealthiest men in America, uh, certainly in his home state of Kansas. Um, <laughs> yeah, uh, you had mostly men of industry. Uh, so the head of, uh, some, you know, steel mills, foundries, um, re- re- refrigerator company, um, uh, guys that were involved in, uh, former military guys, including, um, a former personal aide to general Douglas MacArthur, who again is a prominent figure in this time period, you know, who got into some, uh, very serious, uh, power struggles, um, with civi- with the civilian government. What's um, his name? Oh, his personal aide, um, T Coleman Andrews. 
T. Coleman um, Andrews. Okay. Yeah. And probably uh, the biggest weirdo of the bunch, and somebody that we've actually mentioned before in the first arc, um, our good friend uh, with the hilarious name and voice of Revilo Oliver. Yes. yes, his first name is his last name backwards. Yes. Um, <laughs> Real, too. It's his birth name. Yes, it is his yeah. birth name. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, who was... Okay, I don't know how to sum him up uh, We mentioned quickly. him because his text was published in the same book as David Myatt's text, I think. That was the connection. Yeah, absolutely. So he mm-hmm. was um, an academic. He was the academic of the bunch. Mm-hmm. Um, Revilo Oliver was a very strange man. He was a classicist. Um, He studied like Sanskrit and Greek uh, and Latin, you know, Mm. Myatt would, Myatt would approve, but you know, Myatt never um, got to Sanskrit. So this guy's clearly superior. Yeah. (laughs) Myatt uh, did Arabic though, I think. Right. That's true. Yeah. Um, Revilo Oliver would be the direct link to like really extreme um, white nationalist and, and outright Nazi stuff later. Cause he left the John Birch society in 68. I believe he was kicked out um, together but, with, uh, with some Serbian guy, right? Uh, Draskovic. Yeah. Well, um, no. <laughs> yeah. Draskovic might be a, a character for the next arc. Uh, Cause he doesn't actually right. feature too prominently in here. Mm-hmm. Although you can tell that, um, that Welch knew some stuff about Yugoslavia. Well, We'll see that in the, mm-hmm. in the blue right. book. Um, but, you know, Revilo was one of the kind of lead ideological figures in developing their Americanist ideas. Um, he had been even previously a well-known conspiracy theory guy and, you know, pretty much well, a Nazi sympathizer and fascist all around. Um, he was kind of a weak link for them later because he was absolutely nuts it got you know published a lot of uh kennedy assassination conspiracies in american opinion um and became very well known for that um and you know like i said most of these guys are businessmen uh a couple like ex-military guys and then revilo p oliver now these assholes would become what welch dubbed his national council um he gave himself the official title of founder which is always capitalized. Uh, Mm. And he refers to himself as the founder and even says, you know, this national council will serve to advise your founder. Uh, (laughs) (laughs) Mm -hmm. um, I mean, you can see already that it has a very kind of authoritarian structure. Yeah. Uh, Now he says, and this is a distinction, which you see right wing people in America make today is that, um, the group should follow a Republican form of organization, not a Democratic one. And this is an important distinction that they constantly make and that you hear like dickheads on the internet saying today, like, America's not a democracy. It is Actually, a public. Um, yeah. but wait a minute, you say. The majority should rule, yes, but not to the extent of destroying the rights of the minority. And now, ladies and gentlemen, we are no longer describing a democracy. We are speaking of the republic and and this is this is very birchy and very well okay uh because okay. you know this is something that they push really hard they make propaganda videos about it um you know something but to them that basically means that you know it's some sort of individual uh i guess stronger authoritative rule <laughs> in sure. uh in this in the organization and this is how they they want the country to be organized because that's you know how the founding fathers intended yeah. um and and so um yes you have welch as the fuhrer of this organization um and with his little uh advising council now like i said the the founding conference lasted two days and the result of that is this book um the blue book, which is, you know, the found foundational text. And this is where he outlines the entire ideology, his worldview and his plans for how to combat, uh, this vast communist conspiracy. Now, uh, I'd also, oh yeah, just like to mention real quick, you know, he, he calls this a Republican form of organization. It, it seems to me really to resemble a corporate structure, right? Mm-hmm. And he's like CEO and, you know, uh, uh-huh. And I think he agrees with this. I think he sees these things as the same. Like uh, I don't disagree. The the business model is the model for the state, and that's and that's how it should be. Um, so let's take a look at 
some of the blue book. Yeah, uh, crack open that blue book. You know, he's he's very much aware that um he has kind of a sense of humor, I will say. Um but in that kind of really dry 1950s businessman way. Um so you <laughs> I know, I think I can picture what you're talking about. <laughs> well, he's like you know, he says, oh, I know this is going to be boring to some of you guys, but, you know, we have secretaries making coffee for all of us, so we'll take oh. lots of coffee breaks. Okay, and I got you. It's, have luncheons and, you know, that kind of thing. Okay, uh, yeah, it's, uh, yeah, conference humor. Yeah, he, he, he right. always kind of references that. He's like, okay, well, here I go on my thing again. Um, <laughs> uh, oh, man, I don't know if I can handle a self-deprecating, like, Nazi comic. Now, I would never want to belong to some militia that would have me for a member. Yes. <laughs> okay. So, we know, right before we dive into the Blue Book, let's just say what made them initially famous from the politician, when parts of the politician were leaked. It's that he called President Eisenhower and several other top-ranking U.S. officials, Secretary of State, Director of the CIA, as confirmed communists who were actively working for communist interests directed by some sort of, to quote Miller's Crossing, Yeg Central in Moscow. Um, Who confirmed them as communists, does he say? Ah, this will Mm. will become an issue, because once it was leaked, we were like, well, what do you base this on? He's like, well, I know because I studied how the communist works. Uh, And I see that that this is... um, this is what's going on. But, okay, that leads to the question, what does communism mean for Welch? How is it everywhere? How is Eisenhower... <laughs> Free candy for everybody. It's yeah. madness. How is, how, how is Eisenhower a communist? How is the director of the CIA a communist? How are all, all right. these people communists? Yeah, well, he has a very, <laughs> very broad definition of this that like he seems to apply at will to anything that he deems to be quote-unquote collectivist. So uh-huh. according, according to Revilo Oliver, uh, the communist conspiracy started with the founding of the IWW, um, mm. and then the Communist Party of, uh, of America, uh, and you know, knowing that the good, persuading the good God-fearing Americans to, be, to communism would be difficult, they began to infiltrate all levels of American society in order to promote a collectivist idea so against the individualist uh, mm-hmm. basis of American society to promote collectivist ideas so that they could eventually dupe Americans uh, into falling for a one world government led by Moscow. Now, of course, um, Revilo's timeline starts before the Russian Revolution. And even then they knew that like uh, it was going to be hard to convince Americans. But then when the Re- Russian revolution happens, then there's a very clear plot. And that is when they uh, really get to the hard work of infiltrating um, all levels of American society. Yeah. So, because, you know, Russia is a small place. They wrap that thing up like this and uh, they were like, well, what else? We yes. <laughs> yes. Um, now, again, like I mentioned, you know, Welch admired, most in the U.S. government, Senator McCarthy. To him, it was, you know, the person on the inside who had just begun to scratch the surface, right? He saw that those connections were there, that the communists were there, but not even McCarthy, because he was still in the system, understood how deep that went, mm-hmm. right? Um, and so, okay, the detailed communist plan for world domination, uh, like I said, begins really to take form after the Russian revolution and that, you know, Lenin had specific plans. Um, and this is kind of his own little domino theory, but to him, it's, it's way more, um, cunning and insidious, um, that, you know, the, the first plan is to get what they can in the non West, well, not Western Europe yet. Uh, but Asia definitely, uh, was, you know, was Lenin's, next step um and and then you know they'd somehow manipulate the west into falling uh you know not necessarily through direct military confrontation in in fact he believes that preoccupation with the military threat of the soviet union is a distraction to drain the american state of money um, so that the communists can continue to infiltrate and destroy from within. Hmm. Um, now, the next 
the to welch the biggest step uh that the soviets were able to take in realizing their plan was the formal recognition of the ussr in 1933 to him this was an absolutely devastating blow because you know it gave legitimacy to the soviet state and thus made it easier through you know trade and diplomacy for the soviets to you know no longer be isolated and be able to you know spread their tentacles everywhere mm. but most importantly and this is pretty wacky that it was the second world war was like the biggest thing that the ussr ever achieved and in fact that the second world war and the involvement of the allies in it was a manipulation by stalin uh to fulfill his dreams of world domination. So he says specifically that Soviet agents, you know, manipulated the West into entering this war to win it for the Soviet Union, which, yeah. you know, uh, <laughs> I think like 20 some million Soviet yeah. citizens that died in that war and did most of the actual fighting might have something to say about that. Or, you know, uh, mm. the fact that, you know, the... Germans came pretty close to, <laughs> to mm -hmm. taking Leningrad and Moscow. And, uh, it was a bold know, strategy, Boris. It was a bold strategy. <laughs> uh, a very bold strategy and, and planned from day one. Yes. Because um, <laughs> the idea was that if you sow this chaos and create this war, that then, you know, he would be able to expand unnoticed. And, you know, to him, the, you know, agreements between the allies to, you know, arrange the post-world order into these kind of zones of control was absolute evidence of that and that you know the west was completely duped um and of course uh stalin turned his turned the world's attention through his agents to the crimes of the nazis so that he could do this right not that like you know the nazis were doing these crimes and you know it was something that people in western europe saw as well sure uh, yeah. but it was all a you know a, a plot by stalin the puppet uh -huh. master stalin really like arranging how the world sees these events in order to suit their interests uh -huh. so okay so like i said uh, so again like uh, with the minutemen we can see here that the communists assume this role that's usually given to the jews by fascists i guess absolutely yeah 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 yeah, yeah. um i mean revilo oliver would have eventually go full on into the anti-Semitic thing. And that was, you know, of course the communists are the Jews, this and that. Mm -hmm. Welch always kept a, a formal distance. I mean, I guess we'll talk a little bit about his racial ideas in a mm -hmm. little bit. Um, but cause you know, that's also crucial to the communist plot that would happen after the war. Mm -hmm. So, you know, he, he, like I said, he saw the consolidation of uh, Soviet power in Eastern Europe to be evidence of the fact that Stalin had planned this all along. And uh, one thing, uh, a little um, uh, treat for our listeners, he named Draps uh, Draja Mihailovic, oh. uh, which, which I found interesting. And it's not his only reference to Yugoslavia that's very specific. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, he's talking about how the Soviets were able to take control of, you know, Poland, uh, Czechoslovakia. He talks, you know, poor Czechoslovaks you know blah 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 and then he says in july 1946 stalin's hatchet man tito uh completed his crushing grasp of yugoslavia by publicly shooting um mihailovich general mihailovich uh -huh. um, and cruelly offering amnesty to thousands and thousands of chetniks <laughs> yeah well you know Cunning stalin's, bastard. stalin's hatchet man but yeah. um but of course it's not just that so like he said before Stalin always in Lenin. In fact, this is all a f a film fulfillment of Lenin's uh, ultimate ambition was, was Asia. And so to him, the decolonization process that started after the second world war was absolutely terrifying. And they were all pretty much communists, even the ones that said they weren't mm -hmm. right. So, um, 
he goes on and on about how Sukarno in Indonesia is actually a communist, oh. uh, despite what he says, <laughs> and despite the fact that, well, you know, the, the, the country is full of devout Muslims. How could, you know, a communist come to power there? And then he said, Poland is full of devout Catholics, and the communists duped them there. And, and uh, so uh, some of the other leaders that he name drops here, uh, Nehru is a communist. Uh-huh, um, okay. uh-huh. <laughs> Uh, Kwame Nkrumah is definitely a communist. Definitely. Um, and yeah, I, I'd imagine that, um, you know, the non-aligned movement later would even fulfill this dream for him. Oh, sure. <laughs> even more, right? Oh, yeah. Because it's like, you know, Stalin's hatchet man, Tito, getting all the, uh, you know, African states and you know, <laughs> Asian states together. Yeah. Um, so they're all communists. They're all part of the communist plot to take Asia. Of course, China, you know fell to the communists um formosa taiwan being the last like bastion of kind of freedom uh basically unless you were still under some sort of direct occupation uh by a european power you were communist uh-huh. um so yeah that's it, it's literally pretty much everyone um <laughs> and even better uh, this one fucking blew my mind completely. Hawaii. Uh, oh. The state of Hawaii is absolutely firmly in the hands of communists. Want some communism. Even more so than like the rest of the states. Like It's completely communist. And, you know, Hawaii hadn't become a state. You know, it had become a state quite recently, you know, at this point. Yeah. Um, we were talking, you know, this came out in, what, 1956. Um, uh, but, you know, even the plot for uh, Hawaiian statehood was a communist plot. And uh, th- this kind of this kind of reminded me of, of Trump in, in the way that uh, he said it. You know, he's like, you know, if you need if you have any questions that, you know, Hawaii is firmly in the hands of the communists, just ask any of the leading families. And then he goes on to, you know, list yeah, a bunch yeah. of white people's names like because, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like, uh, yeah, those people, of course, were, um, you know. Uh, suffering because both Republican d- and Democrats there were full on commies and they were like mm. joining America to destroy it. Um, so there you go. I had absolutely no idea that Hawaii uh, <laughs> was a bastion of communism. I suspect it has something to do with the fact that it never had a white majority. Mm-hmm. Um, uh-huh. And maybe to the him, that was just an indication of, uh, you know, communism. Uh and it is in many ways um, because the next biggest plot the, to him, the biggest, like Sorry, one just, of the major, you won't be laughing when they start setting up volcanoes in Kansas. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> just wait till Mauna Kea pops up. In, <laughs> and that word, what does it mean? Mauna Kea. Let's break that down. <laughs> um, mana, mana, mano, one state, one state, one world government. <laughs> um but of course uh it's not just it's not just hawaii uh so you know he's directing the attention of you know the people that he's assembled to then some of the domestic threats outside of hawaii um of course it's the unions um it's churches that uh Basically, all churches that don't preach some sort of prosperity gospel um, (laughs) are also in on it because the Reds have managed to, like, uh, occupy positions in Mm -hmm. religious organizations. They managed to go back in time and tell Jesus (laughs) to make his followers donate all their possessions so they can give them to the poor. Uh, But most importantly, the civil rights movement. Uh, Yeah, of course. The civil rights movement is to him 100% a communist plot. To um, and I quote, um, it is their plan gradually carried out over a long period with meticulous cunning to stir up such bitterness between whites and blacks in the South that s- small flames of civil disorder would ine- inevitably result. They could fan and uh, coalesce these little flames into one great conflagration of civil war, and in time, if the need arose, uh, blah 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 blah. Yeah, the bitterness comes out of the civil war, uh, civil mo- rights movement. Yeah, uh, yeah. Um, they have some funny ideas of the actual American Civil War too. Uh, mm-hmm. But yeah, th- that was basically an unfortunate thing that happened because secret societies arranged uh, for the war to happen. Um, 
that okay. like even people in the union um that there was like a long standing plot of secret societies to push abolitionism and then like you know divide America into this like unfortunate war but you know it was it was the illuminati's fault basically not uh, uh yeah because they were against slavery yeah yeah okay now <laughs> now communists now to him he says that the term civil rights is an exact parallel to agrarian reform in communist countries. And he says specifically China, um, that, you know, uh, it's a way of, um, you know, it's, it's something that sounds good, but that the communist really has, uh, no interest in the welfare of the Negroes, uh, than the Chinese do for the Chinese peasants. Um, thus the civil rights movement is not only an attempt to like fan civil war and part of this larger conspiracy um, against, you know, larger communist conspiracy within the U S government, but also that it's, it will even like form a separate Soviet Negro Republic um, in the South. And that, you know, that this again, now that like we'll talk a little bit about what they think about the government, but this is a coercion uh, and, you know, and it threatens the liberty of the individual by, uh, by imposing the state imposing uh, desegregation is um, tyranny uh, yeah. and part of the communist plot. Uh, and of course, let's not forget the very, the most obvious um symbol of Soviet world domination. And that is of course the United Nations. Uh, now the John Birch society was very famous for being, uh, anti-United Nations. You know, I even remember seeing like billboards in the U S they're the ones that say like, get us out and, you know, mm -hmm. uh, get us out of the UN and the us is like an American flag too. And you know, American flag colors now. Yeah. The United Nation existed solely as a plot to take away American sovereignty and bring uh, America into the fold of Moscow's world government. You know, uh, my grandma thought that the UN was training out in the Pioneers to, to make New Jersey part of the um, global socialist government. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. she, was she a bircher? <laughs> I, not that I know of. She was just uh, a little disturbed. <laughs> well, that's what I'm you actually didn't have to be a bircher to for all this shit to filter down. I mean, yeah, it really yeah. it, it went everywhere, yeah. right? Um, and that's you know that's why we're talking about them today. Um, so okay, I, I suspect that the UN thing also. Uh, I mean, he doesn't really say this, but the fact that all these uh, newly independent states were had you know supposedly a sh you know an equal say in this uh, you know had a was was indication that all of them even the anti-communist leaders were in fact communists because you know they're part of the UN too. And uh, one of the greatest campaigns that they said they could do is try to prevent red China from joining the UN. Because you know if you give them the legitimacy that Stalin had in 1933 when the USSR was recognized, then that will just accelerate uh, communist takeover of the world. Um, so you get their kind of brief um, outline of what he thinks is going on, you know, what happened in the last previous, in the previous decades and what's happening right now, you know, uh, you know, cause he said, you know, who would have thought, you know, 50 years ago that, you know, half the world would be controlled by communists Yeah, uh, as it is now. Right. <laughs> um, oh, and uh, actually I will here just uh, mention the second time uh, that he brings up, Yugoslavia for our listeners, because uh, he brings up the need to uh, find the best anti-communist refugees from all the countries in the world that are being taken over by Soviet power and um, give them a home in America and set up governments in exile um, from, you know, with the best of the best of the anti-communists so that, you know, they can promote them and help them take down, you know, the communist order and they can go back and rule their own countries. Uh, now here he brings up, um, Milo Vangelis. Oh, no uh, way. Which is a, again, a very specific reference. And he says that, you know, but we should not look at people like Milo Vangelis, who, you know, was one of the, 
probably the highest ranking Yugoslav defector for, or not defector, a dissident um, in the Yugoslav Communist Party. I mean, Ray, um, maybe you can give a brief. Uh, I mean, he was a. Uh, he- Pre Second World War, he was one of the more more kind of hardcore, you could say even Stalinist in the party. Um, and then early on, uh, after the war, he started developing more kind of critical ideas about the system and had some hopes that it will, let's say, democratize, uh, for lack of a better word. Um, and I, I probably he thought that Yugoslavia is moving in that direction, uh, uh, especially after the split with Stalin. But he went a bit too far for Tito's uh, taste, so he got arrested. And uh, he, uh, he also he wrote a book which was called uh, "New Class," which was um, a kind of a class critique of Yugoslavia, saying that a new bureaucratic class has formed and that it serves the function of a ruling class in Yugoslavia and so on. And this book was translated in many languages. Um, yeah. Yeah. And so, I mean, some of Gilles's texts at the time were being promoted by kind of right-wing figures in America. Yeah. And by CIA, uh, actually, I think that yeah. some of his publishers were connected to American intelligence and stuff like that. Right. Huh. Now, Welch says, disregard these people because they're actually still communists, right? They're, they're approaching this from a communist perspective. Mm. Uh, so no, not those guys get the real anti-communists and set them up, give them resources, mm-hmm. blah, blah, blah. Um, but now I'd like to move on to the kind of bulk and the really um, ideological foundations of Welch's ideas. We're going to see some familiar names here. Um, specifically Oswald Spangler, mm-hmm. uh, who uh, we've talked about in uh, in the first arc, um, relating to uh, some of David Myatt's ideas, right? Um, uh, Fritz, maybe do you, do you have a uh, all quick I want to say of... about Spangler is that I am just he's haunting me. He's he's I dread that motherfucker because I know I've got to read the fucking decline of the West if I'm going to read Yolki. <laughs> <laughs> it's a it's a daunting task, but uh, Spangler, yeah, Spangler's where we get the idea of like Magian society, which we talked a lot about with Myatt, and that each civilization has its own like special little spirit um, that that uh, has um, a process that every civilization goes through, uh, ending in its decline, um, usually through some sort of dictatorship or whatever but uh he did was wasn't a bad thing for spangler and this is some kind of fact of nature but i guess what's mostly important about him is that he he gives nazis the historical basis for claiming that there is a immense clash of civilizations that are wholly um incompatible with each other um right especially this idea of the major so the Magian society being kind of the Middle Eastern society, yes. right? Yeah, Which yeah. encompasses Judaism, but also like Eastern Christianity. Right. And in some cases, Christianity in general, like for Myatt um, and, and others. And that's like Magian society, whereas there's a distinct Western civilization, which is different from that and had its, its own, uh, you know, trajectories and history and, you know, whatever um, mentality. Exactly. Uh, that is incompatible with others now he specifically uh says that he bases a lot of this worldview off of spangler but develops on it further um so like he disregards some of it um but kind of works on applying this to an americanist idea that america is itself a distinct civilization that grows out of the declining Western civilization, um, but is its own thing and is a completely separate world and mentality from the rest of the world. Right. And it's its own civilization. And if we're not careful, it will wind up uh, where Western Europe is now because Western Europe is already being lost. And he uses some kind of um, funny, uh, he has some funny history here. 
Uh, so he says the Roman Empire of the West started dying from cancer of collectivism from the time of Diocletian uh, when he imposed his new deal. Uh, <laughs> so <laughs> so the, uh, Emperor Diocletian impl- imposed the New Deal on the Roman Empire and then thus starting a, a, a collectivist cancer, which would allow um, for Rome to fall uh, at the hands of barbarians because it had been so weakened by collectivism. Uh, that it became uh, easy prey. And so, again, you know, this allusion there, of course, to the New Deal um, when talking about the Roman Empire is, of course, absurd. But, you know, he's trying to make his case to this group of assembled businessmen and fascist intellectual, singular intellectual. Um, (laughs) Right. (laughs) And so, of course, you know, this this is our you know, a concern for Americans because the British empire, you know, all of its current colonies and, you know, its settler colonies like Canada and Australia and New Zealand are susceptible to the same kind of rot that the rest of Europe is because it didn't separate in this way to become a distinct civilization that embraced individualism like America did. I don't think Spengler said that you can just decide you're a civilization. Like, I don't think that was part of the the program. Uh, he has a really long winded um, explanation for this. I mean, it goes, I'm like really conde- trying to condense this down because so it's pages and pages and pages of his like kind of analysis of Spengler's ideas and all these different cases about how all these, um, you know, how the West was brought down by collectivism. The debate or the dialogue, as it's now called, is not between conservatives and liberals. It goes back in history long before those words were ever invented. The opposing points of view properly are identified as individualism versus collectivism. And their champions are called individualists and collectivists. But, you know, the the main point here, and this is, he emphasizes this as well, that the United States um, is not an independent country. It is a whole new civilization. Okay. Um, And all right. I mean, that that kind of mirrors some of the Christian identity stuff that we discussed. Uh, I was thinking about the tribe of Manasseh just now. Yeah. 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 I mean, it formulates it using different language, but the point seems pretty similar, I would say. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And especially especially in this focus on individual versus collective. Mm -hmm. Um, Now, like, I dove down a little bit into what they how they understand individualism because it is very important for this Americanist right-wing ideology, right? Which is, um, you know, sometimes when you, when you talk to people in other countries in in Europe, for example, a lot of people are like, well, you know, America is weird because it has this whole like right-wing anti-government tradition, right? One that is kind of anti-statist. That's not really true. Um, And they're pretty explicit about that. Now, you know, of course, uh, Welch goes on and on about, you know, uh, how government is the problem. Uh, You know, government must be curtailed, the liberty of the individual, coercion, the state has uh, a monopoly over the use of force and, you know, uh, force the individual uh, and bend it to its will. Um, And this is a bad thing. Um, But... Yeah, they're but. not against the state, and they're uh-huh. very clear about this. So I watched this uh, like propaganda film they have uh, that came out right after the uh, Birch Society's founding, in which they talk about this. Right, so he's he's saying, um, and it's not Welch saying this; it's Welch's words. It's some guy that you know talks nicely and has like a folksy American demeanor. Uh-huh. Uh, he's like okay. talking to an audience, and he's like, "Well, what does this mean? <laughs> well, on the one side here, you have anarchy." And huh. that's advocated by the anarchists. Well, yeah. The extremists at the other end would be those who advocate total government. And who are they? Well, the communists, of course. Communism and Nazism are not opposites. Call it right or left. It makes no difference. They're both at the same totalitarian end of the political spectrum. Mm. Now, when we say we're against government, we are, aren't saying that we're for anarchy. Um, in fact, like we believe that government absolutely must exist and that and that their ideology is, in fact, the true middle of the road. Mm. Um, I see. Between anarchy and totalitarianism. Yes. 
mm-hmm. and that this was you know outlined by the fi- founding fathers and uh and is being lost now to this creeping collectivism um now as we say as we said before he comes out of the business world so all of this is framed predictably in like economic terms right which is you know the the totalitarians you know have a good idea you know they we both see suffering in the world and we want to help the suffering in the world but the problem that the collectivist doesn't understand is that you know of course uh there needs to be incentive uh <laughs> for people to be producers cuz otherwise they won't work um and of course that um that there are also people who are of a specific mentality sometimes uh in some of these texts referred to as a slave mentality Uh uh, which makes them dependent on on others right that they don't have the capacity uh to uh work unless there's some sort of incentive down the line they'll just sit there and rely on on charity and that what they want is the freedom of choice uh and Freedom of choice means that the individual decides what he does, how much he gives. I mean, this is all really familiar yeah, to you because yeah, it's is, mainstream yeah. Yeah, yeah, okay. American conservative thinking now. Yeah, but, very I mean, comfortable in, territory here, suddenly. Yeah, but yeah. In, you know, in the 1950s, a lot of this was you know kind of extreme, yeah. right? Because because uh, he then goes in, starts talking about you know coercion and why coercion is bad, why we should oppose civil rights legislation uh, because you know it will force because in a democracy the majority rules and the get this minorities are not protected so like you know a minority opinion will be uh, you know st- stamped out in a democracy and a republic safeguards that but in a way he's literally you know saying advocating for minority rule right <laughs> yes <laughs> because but i guess case, i assume his minority are business magnates and <laughs> right but they, they specifically say you know this is the government of the people the government of the people is when the state doesn't doesn't decide how you use your money oh. and <laughs> that gives you liberty and that you can't you can't legislate any or or push any kind of redistributive practice because and I find this very funny. There's just not enough money to go around. Oh, like really? rich, he's like, if you took all of rich people's money, you know, it wouldn't last long enough to actually help everybody out. Now, you know, the Koch brothers are worth like $44 billion right yeah. now, uh, which I think somebody could make a reasonable argument that, you know, $44 billion could be used all kinds of interesting ways. Sure. Uh, but, you know, th- this is this very common sense, um, you know, uh, rationale, which is, you know, there's not enough to go around and, you know, some people are going to be rich and some people are, you know, unable to attain that. And, you know, rich people should give to charity and, you know, that should be a thing that everybody does. But if he chooses not to, he shouldn't be compelled to, right? It's amazing. And, like you could be talking about the contemporary Republican party right now. That's like, what I'm saying. And this is, this is like, cause the video that um, I'm citing now is shit that they put out on television, right? right. I mean, okay. this is stuff, and this, you know, this gets into like the, Welch's points on how to organize and what to do. Um, okay, so uh, I guess we're wrapping up the ideological section, huh? Um, oh, why? I could bask in this for days. Well, let's then. Um, <laughs> I mean, it's interesting that, you know, they, they talk about coercion uh, in a very specific way way right coercion against whom business people uh like so i mean co- concretely we're talking you know they're, they're opposed to segregation right because segregation would be a coercive measure to impose the state's will on like desegregation right so the fact that there was state like state oppression like of huge segments of the population who were excluded from society and participation in society is somehow not an issue of coercion yeah. and not, uh, not a problem. Uh, th- the problem is that, you know, what will happen to us? Right. And that's why government's bad. The government isn't bad because Jim Crow laws existed <laughs> and that, you know, they, 
the you know white southerners and well i mean throughout the u.s uh, that you know the entire segregationist system existed that wasn't a problem to him the problem is that you know if if you desegregate schools you know we won't have the choice uh, <laughs> which is like okay i mean the people didn't have a choice to go to segregated schools this is yeah. like imposed by the state upon mm. them legally like this is the issue. And I guess this is the middle of the road, right? I mean, you could always this, become a Mormon. I guess that would solve it for you. Uh, they did have some uh, Mormon supporters. Yeah, no doubt. For a while. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, uh, actually, like some of the, so, you know, they had some famous um, uh, desegregate uh, or segregationist uh, supporters. I mean, this is a big, big, big part of their um, uh, base because in fact, it seems that, you know, they had at their height, like I said, around 100,000 members, but it was really concentrated in certain states, um, California being one of them. And again, this art California comes up a lot. Um, but then Texas, uh, Arkansas, you know, southern states, and especially, specifically with the issue of like desegregation, the civil rights movement uh, came in, right? Um, uh, uh, George S. Benson and the National Education Program, uh, which is now... Harding University, Arkansas, oh. Oh. Um, was this uh, one of these anti-desegregation schools, and there were quite a few of these, uh, and this this made up a big uh, base of their supporters in the South. So again, coercion is not having choice, not right. having the ability to choose between oh, poor you between schools, products, or, uh, if you want a dictatorship or not. <laughs> well, if you you know, want to live in a white only community, that's fine. Yeah. That's America, <laughs> baby. If if the state, you know, makes laws that I'm sorry, since curtail their... black people from doing things, that's that's a matter of choice. But also like there's such an enormous amount of paranoia here. Like what when has it ever been a problem to find a white only neighborhood in America? <laughs> like there <laughs> well, there's it's twenty twenty one and they're still out there. I mean there's tons of them. No, absolutely, yeah. Um so what have we learned about government and the state? Government and the state, Fritz, is when you don't have the ability to choose how to spend your money. Okay. And when you can't set up a personal fiefdom for yourself that you call a republic. Yeah. What else would it be? <laughs> and when you make the choice on who you live with, how you live, because mm -hmm. that is how the founding fathers intended it. By who now, you mean which race, I assume. Yes, absolutely. Yes, okay. Because, <laughs> uh, you know, there are some people with this slave mentality. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know. Uh, you know, in, in the Blue Book later, when he, he, he mentioned something about, like, um, you know, racism and how it's kind of um, an unfortunate disposition, but like an inevitable one. And so, like, it's kind of okay that people are racist because... Yeah, you get that a lot. Yeah. Every, every racist assumes that everybody's racist. Yeah. And, that, like and that the problem, and the, the, the problem is, is that, you know, um, and, you know, we see that in that quote that I read above, is that, like, it fans division, right? Uh, if, if Anti-racism fans division. Yes. Because Good. if you want to desegregate, that will cause division. Right. Yeah. Bringing people together <laughs> is extremely divisive. Got it. Yeah, in, in this, in the one like propaganda video of theirs, you know, he even goes further, which is like, you know, the, this like slave mentality also um, is a resentful and like violent mentality um, because you know they they're resentful of the people that have well, you know, uh, because they do not, and that you know uh, they're used to being given things. Um, uh huh. Right. And so it breeds like a violent resentment, which is, again, when, when, when he says that, you know, desegregation causes division between whites and blacks, it's like, well, well then what is segregation? That's unity. It's a, a literal division. <laughs> I mean, yeah. does, you know, it doesn't get more divided than that. I mean, let's put aside the fact that it completely denies any, any kind of agency to literally anyone that's not a rich white person. Um, Desiring agency is slave mentality, Boris. Yes. <laughs> Nietzsche always said that the will to power is slave slave uh, mentality. Something like that, right? It's been a while. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> and so the communists are able to then dupe these like poor innocent people into believing that, you know, 
having rights uh, to do anything uh, is somehow uh, a communist plot. Yeah, of course. God, great thinkers, these people. Fantastic. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I mean, they all come to the same conclusions. Like, they take different routes, you know? Yeah. Like Asian identity and Minutemen and this asshole. But in the end, it's the conclusions are the same. Well, yeah, and and the conclusion here being that like the the people that actually have all the power, which is them, they are like millionaire right uh, captains of industry, are the ones that are actually persecuted. Yes, right there, and and you know this is you see this time and time again in all these different iterations of fascist thought, right? So like, or just watch you know, C-SPAN. <laughs> yeah, but it, you know, and he goes into this persecution. Uh, anxiety more and more and more in the blue book. It's all about that. Like how we're actually the ones that are uh, oppressed and they try to deny this in public a lot. You know, they say stuff like, you know, you, you may think that, you know, everybody in the John Birch society is like a rich person, but that's not true. Like most of us are from the broad middle classes and like we aspire to be rich and there's nothing wrong with that. But you know, most of us aren't rich ourselves and sure. When they had 100,000 people, it was largely middle class, like suburban white Americans. Yeah. Although some of the demographic studies that were done of that showed that, yes, it was mostly upper middle class, uh, you know, Protestant white people and like and ex-military people specifically. The true sons um, of Manasseh. Yes. But these are the people who are actually oppressed. And what's more, it doesn't really matter who their members are in that broad sense, because it is a f- fairly author it's a pretty authoritarian um you know organizational structure right yeah explicitly. And again their yeah. anti-statism has nothing to do with any kind of critique of authority or anything like that it's it's literally about maintaining these kind of personal fiefdoms uh, yeah for these rich people right because just and the, 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 the path from this to like the 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 Koch brothers you know um well, creation of of American libertarianism and shit like that is just so clear, so sharp, you know. Absolutely, yeah. It is a direct descendant of this, and you know, the Tea Party again as being a you know astroturfed group that you know somehow grassroots because you know regular people joined it. Um, it doesn't matter because the only reason that it exists is because some billionaires decided it, it exists. At least this motherfucker said we're not anarchists. I mean, thank you for that, at least. (laughs) Like, what happened to that? (laughs) What indeed, Fritz? Well, that's the end of part one of Boris's study into the John Birch Society. Join us next week for part two, where we realize this episode really should have a part two. See you then. I was feeling sad and kind of blue. I didn't know what I was going to do. The communists was coming around. They was in the air. They was on the ground. They wouldn't give me no peace. <laughs> well, I run down most hurriedly and joined the John Birch Society. Got me a secret membership card, started walking off down the road. You! I'm a real John Bircher now, look it out. Now we all agree with Hitler's views, although he killed six million Jews. It don't matter too much that he was a fascist, at least you can't say he was a communist. That's to say, like, if you got a cold, take a shot of malaria. I was looking everywhere for them gold darn reds. I got up in the morning, looked under my bed. Looked in the sink behind the chair. Looked in the glove compartment of my car. Looking everywhere, I couldn't find them. I was looking in the sink and behind the chair. I was looking for them reds everywhere. I looked way up the chimney hole, looked deep down inside my toilet bowl. They got away. <laughs> I was sitting home alone and started to sweat. I figured they was in my TV set. 
I peeked behind the picture frame, got a shock when my feet hit me in the brain. Them Reds did it. I know they did, them hardcore ones. I quit my job so I could work all alone and I changed my name to Sherlock Holmes. Following some clues from my detective bag, I discovered there was red stripes on the American flag. Oh, Betsy Ross. Now, <laughs> oh, Eisenhower, he's a Russian spy. Lincoln, Jefferson, and that Roosevelt guy to my nose. There's just one man that's really a true American. George Lincoln Rockwell. I know for a fact he hates commies because he picketed the movie Exodus. Well, I finally started thinking straight when I ran out of things to investigate. Couldn't imagine doing anything else, and I'm home investigating myself. Hope I don't find out anything. Good God. 